Everywhere, the Allies sailed safely over the oceans under the wing of the Royal Navy. But it is the duty of a fleet to destroy enemy warships. On August the 28th, the Admiralty planned a daring assault deep into German home waters. Their destination was Heligoland Bight, the stretch of sea between the small, heavily armed island fortress of Heligoland and the mouths of the Elbe and the Jade, where the main German fleet was concentrated. The Admiralty knew that German destroyers patrolled this area every night. They'd planned a trap for the Germans. But when German light cruisers appeared on the scene, the British destroyers found themselves in difficulties. Then suddenly, an impressive new element surged into the battle. Admiral Beatty's battle cruisers racing into action. They quickly pounded the German cruisers into wrecks with their big guns. Admiralty signalling muddles caused much confusion among the British squadrons, but the action was an unqualified British success. They lost no ships, the Germans lost three cruisers and a destroyer, a defeat right on their own doorstep. Admiral Tirpitz, creator of the High Seas Fleet, lamented, It was a day fateful for the work of our Navy. The Emperor did not want losses of this sort. Orders were issued by the Kaiser framed to restrict still further the initiative of the Commander-in-Chief of the North Sea Fleet. The loss of ships was to be avoided. Fleet sorties and any greater undertakings must be approved by the Kaiser in advance. Germany turned to her underwater weapons. The frightening potential of mine and torpedo was still a haunting enigma. Soon, they gained an outstanding and ominous success. On September the 22nd, near the Dutch coast, one of Germany's oldest U-boats, the U-9, sighted a patrol of three old British cruisers, the Hogue, the Aboukir, and the Cressy. Within an hour, it had sunk all three, with a loss of 1,400 lives, more men than Nelson lost in all his battles. On October the 27th, Audacious, a new British dreadnought, hit a mine and blew up. All the crew were saved, but it was another alarming sign of the shifting balance of naval war. On the surface, too, Germany still boasted one conspicuous success. The cruiser Emden, detached from von Spee's squadron, was pursuing a hectic and brilliant career of destruction in the busy sea lanes of the Indian Ocean. She was a scarlet pimpernel of the sea, gallant, elusive, always springing surprises on her pursuers. Emden's exploits rang round the world. She captured or sank merchant ship after merchant ship. If they were colliers, she filled her bunkers and took a new lease of life. Eight British men of war combed the Indian Ocean for her in vain. Marine insurance rates rocketed. She delayed the sailing of a New Zealand troop convoy. She entered Penang Harbour and sank a Russian and a French warship. One night she entered the port of Madras and switched on her searchlights. Her guns blazed away at the shore oil tanks. They were wrecked and a million and a half gallons went up in smoke. In Britain the Admiralty's prestige was shaken as even the First Lord, Winston Churchill, had to admit. 
the press and public were not in a position to understand all that the Admiralty was doing. They saw only a few German cruisers doing whatever they chose and sinking British merchantmen. A great deal of discontent began to make itself heard and felt. After two profitable months, Emden sailed to the Cocos Islands and sent a landing party ashore to wreck the radio station. But the new weapon of radio was her undoing. The operator had already signalled for help and the Australian cruiser Sydney was on her way. outgunned and outranged, ran herself onto a reef. The Indian Ocean was safe again. Now the flame of German naval imperialism was flickering out. Only von Spee remained. From the outbreak of war he had eluded his pursuers. Alone with his five ships, cut off from his colonies, he steamed on in the empty vastness of the Pacific. Every day, Churchill studied charts of his possible position and stared at his Admiralty map, pondering where the Asiatic squadron might be. At last, news came that it was sailing towards the coast of Chile. Admiral Craddock, commanding a British squadron in the Pacific, was ordered to hunt him down. Craddock wrote, Somehow, I think we shall say how do you do to these Teutonic gentlemen. I'm generally pretty lucky, and we don't want any more disappointments. Craddock, with the old cruisers Good Hope and Monmouth, and the light cruiser Glasgow and the armed merchant cruiser Otranto, found von Spey near the Bay of Coronel, off the coast of Chile. We formed single line ahead, and Good Hope fired a ranging shot which was short. The enemy, opened, the enemy then opened up with repelling salvos. We did not possess that method of firing, but it soon became apparent to us that the, both the Monmouth and the Good Hope were under severe punishment. About one hour, and there was a terrific explosion in the Good Hope, and she went up like a huge bouquet and disappeared. After that, they concentrated on the Monmouth and us. And the Monmouth were soon in trouble and could make very little effective reply. The Monmouth sank and the whole crew was drowned. Craddock, too, was drowned with the crew of the Good Hope. A fellow admiral said of him, Poor Kit Craddock. He'd always wanted to die on the hunting field or in action. News of the black defeat at Coronel staggered a British public reared on the legend of an unconquerable navy. U-boats, mines, the Emden, and now a British squadron smashed in a fair fight. The Admiralty, already under heavy criticism, reacted instantly and ferociously. The battle cruisers, invincible and inflexible, were ordered out to find von Spee and destroy him. There was to be no delay. The Admiral Superintendent, Devonport, reports that the earliest possible date for completion of Invincible and Inflexible is midnight the 13th of November. Admiralty to CMC Devonport. Ships are to sail Wednesday the 11th of November. They are needed for war service and dockyard arrangements must conform. If necessary, dockyard men should be sent away in the ships to return as opportunity may offer. You are held responsible for the speedy dispatch of these ships in a thoroughly efficient condition. On Wednesday, November the 11th, the two great ships under Admiral Sturdy steamed south.